I got pulled into a conspiracy where they said I was allegedly attempting to import firearms from America into the UK. A month long trial and I tell, you, I tell you what mate, listening to your voice notes back in the courtroom of 50 people mate, everyone's like this at you. The door shut, the TV didn't. When you're a potential AK, you're on your own. So there's nobody else in there. It was a bunk bed with just no one else in there. And I lay on that bed and I'll be straight. That's the one time in the whole three years that my eyes watered up. Some of these guys get to know the female officers. I went to this sea cat jail called The Mount for the last three months in uh, Hemel Hempstead. And the corruption in there, where it's a sea cat, it's low security, run around doing what they want. There was a senior officer. There was videos going around on everyone's phones in there, right? Diverse What's going on guys? This video is sponsored by Louis. Some of you know him on Insta as Loads, one of the best Instagram names, let me tell you that. Louis has been building online businesses for the last five to 10 years and he has spent the last five years coaching others one-to-one -one on how to start businesses. Louis's got over 2,000 profitable testimonials and guys, let me be honest with you, I wouldn't let someone sponsor the show who I didn't vouch for. So trust me, it's legit. Literally, just go send him a DM on Instagram, it's at Loads. All you gotta do is say to him, I come from the Blue Tick Show, help me make some money. And I know most of these people out there scams and there's plenty of people out there offering you millions and millions of pounds and stuff like that louis is one of the one percent who actually do it properly legitly you don't need nothing all you literally need is a phone and wi-fi send him a message and leave the rest to him guys and if you want to know why i'm sitting here pushing it so much it's because realistically Doing a nine to five ain't gonna get you nowhere. And I know most people sit here and say this because they're getting some sort of commission for it and stuff like that, but I really ain't. I'm telling you as a good person, the host of the show, doing a nine to five ain't gonna get you nowhere. So go message Louis, say you come from the boutique show, just ask Louis for the business model, let him do the explaining and let him explain to you how he can help you. I'll see you soon. What's going on guys and welcome back to the Blue Tick Show. Opposite me today, I've got Toby Gray. Toby Gray went prison for blackmail, firearms, and fake money. Welcome to the show. Well, hello. <laughs> Listen, How you doing? Finally got it locked in. Probably the hardest, while, mate. hardest guest to get on the show. Yeah, sorry, I've been a busy boy. <laughs> but we've done it. I hope being a good boy. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Change, man. All right. But listen, before we dive into what I just told the viewers, and they're probably thinking, what? Fake money, firearms, blackberry, you sound like an all round gangster. No, far from it, mate. Listen, let's talk about your upbringing first. Let's talk about a little, little boy, Toby. Little Toby. Little Toby. Yeah, right. And then we'll talk about what you actually done and why you served your sentence. Yeah. All right. Um, I grew up in a nice family, in a nice home in Kent. I had a loving mother and a loving father who supported me. So I'm not going to go down the road of a, a bad childhood. Yeah, yeah. Like most people do. Um, I went to school in Kent. I trained as a personal trainer. I then got a bit bored of that. I moved into the city. I started opening up offshore accounts for people and doing boiler rooms, moving money around. Um, got a bit bored of that. And uh, you say I get a bit bored easily. Um, I then, through that, started meeting certain people, obviously people that are moving money around and sometimes in that grey area of, of human. Yeah. And um, started offering me money to do other things, hide money, um, and started building up a network there and gradually over time it evolved into falling into conspiracies yeah but obviously to dive back back to school a little bit was you good in school no naughty boy getting into fights a little bit i hated it oh, really? i i liked being around the boys i liked going there to see my mates and obviously you start getting older you discover girls didn't you and then you start liking girls in school and that's the reason you want to go but in terms of being there sitting in a fucking classroom i hated it mate when you was younger, did you ever have any ambition to do this? Like, did you ever think, I want to be a, I don't fucking know, millionaire, I want to yeah, be a businessman? exactly that. From, from a young age, I wanted nice things. I'm not saying, my family were a good family, but we never had loads, do you know what I mean? Like, we, we, we were modest. And I wanted, I liked the nicer things in life. I wanted nice things. And I never knew anyone that had a lot of money. Everyone was sort of a working background, you know. You go to school, you get qualified work for a company, you pay your taxes, you get married, you get a mortgage, you have kids, you teach them the same thing, and it goes on and on and on. And and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, that, I, I just didn't want anything to do with it, mate. That wasn't what I wanted at all. And that was where it was a constant, constant battle with what was expected of me 
and from, from the people around me who didn't know any different and what I actually wanted. Did you fall into the life of crime at a young age? or? Yeah, I was selling drugs from a young age, mate. Okay. I would have fought 17, 18, just packets, you know, on a night out, funding my night out, really. Mum and dad find out? Yeah, they knew. They yeah. knew, fucking, yeah, yeah they, of course they did. But by that point, you, they can tell you one thing, you go, all right. But I moved out when I was very young anyway, so, and I've got a good relationship with my family. Oh, fair enough. Listen, if you moved out and you're not doing it under their roof, I guess they don't. They, it was more of a, they know, don't ask, I'm a good person, I'm a good to them, and that's that's all they really cared about, all they really cared about by that point, when I wasn't their problem anymore, you know? That's how it is. That's what my mum's always said to me. While you're living under my roof with my rules, once I was out, she was like, don't give a fuck what you do. Exactly. Just don't get nicked. I mean, that didn't work, did it? Don't get nicked, don't, don't, get, get, don't get killed, and just be a decent person. Yeah, that's I literally that's... all that matters, but obviously the first one, don't get nicked, didn't go to plan. No, 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 not even remotely, mate, yeah. What age was it when you first got arrested? I'm getting arrested from a young age, just for stupid stuff, you know, fighting on a night out, driving offences, mainly possession of drugs, drunk and disorderly, affray, like little, little things when boys being boys, you know. Um, but properly nicked was when I was 29. 29 years old and now? I'm 33 now. Four years ago? So four years ago. That I was got, when you served your... I served my sentence, yeah. Before we dive into what you've done it, I've got one question first. I ask all my guests, what was the first night in prison like? Oh, mate. Do you know what? You, you walk in there and, and the way, way I went in was a little bit different to others because where the initial charge was very serious and I was going into a Category B prison, which is a local jail. So all local jails and Roman prisons are Cat B, apart from Belmarsh, which is a, which is a Cat A and B. I, was, I went first into High Down which is a category B jail. So anyone that's done something of a potential A category crime standard, they can't really house you there properly. So what they do is they assess you for a week and see whether you need to go Belmarsh or not by your behavior. And because the home office um, say, look, do we need to put him in, in Belmarsh straight away? So they put you in um, a green and yellow bodysuit. There are two bodysuits. There's a blue and yellow one for potential escapees. And this, the green and yellow one, they called it a potential cat A. There's a pot cat A. So you can't, you, you have to exercise with fucking officers next to you. You can't leave your cell unless you're wearing this fucking jumpsuit. So my first night in there, they said, right, you can't wear this. You got to wear this and put me in a fucking banana suit. Yeah. Um, and we got into prison quite late at night. So we sat there with the nurse, went, went for all, all the check-in, fucking gave you a vape. I didn't even smoke, mate. And I was like, oh, fucking give me that. They gave yeah. you a vape? They said, do you smoke? I said no. They go, do you want a vape? I went yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they give you a vape. You don't you don't have tobacco in, yeah, yeah. in jail anymore. And they took me to the wing, the induction wing, and they put you put you because the induction wing's grotty, mate. Because people don't stay on there very long, so people haven't done their cells up. They're yeah, not nice. Yeah. It, people stay two nights in there, then they fuck off to their location where they're going to live. And I walked in there and thought, fuck. The door shut. The TV didn't work right, and I was trying to put fucking just put a bit of Channel Four on or something. Is there a single cell? When you're a potential A cat, you're on your own, yeah. So there's nobody else in there. It was a bunk bed with just no one else in there. And I lay on that bed and I'll be straight. That's the one time in the whole three years that my eyes watered up. And they did. And I sat there and thought, is this me for however many years I get? And I, I asked for a pen and paper and I wrote a letter to my old man and my best mate. And I sat there and I just wrote a letter explaining what had happened because I didn't get any phone calls um, I didn't know anyone's numbers. Fuck off. So I didn't get to speak to anyone for the first few weeks of getting in. I didn't know how to contact anyone, mate. So how I, do you get people's numbers in prison? You, you just have to know them. You write to them and say, "Can you send your num send your number in?" Fuck off. So I. But do you know what's mad? The only number I could remember was an ex girlfriend from like ten years ago. Because you know when you're at home and you and you're dialing someone's number in on the house when phone, you're blocked, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when you're dialing someone's number in on the house phone, I dialed it in so many times when I was like nineteen, twenty. I remembered her number, so I put her number on the system. They got it approved. I've rung her. I said, "Listen, this is so fucking random. I've not spoken to you in like five years. I'm in jail, and you're the only number I know." And she went, "What do you want me to do?" So she went on Instagram, messaged all the people I wanted them to message, got the numbers for me. I rung her back, and she had the numbers for me to write down. So that I could put them on the system, get them approved, and and you, it takes a while to settle into jail. It takes you a good month to get because you can only order your food and stuff once a week, and then it comes the following week. So if you don't have money on you, you're eating one hot meal a day. 
So you need it takes you a month to get properly settled in, get all your numbers on, get get the regime of your food and money coming through, get a job to be able to really live and, and not feel like shit. Yeah. And obviously you're a big guy. You're not small. Yeah. You're a big lump. Any problems in prison regarding it? Because when no. there's a big guy walking into people try and people say that, and I, I promise you, yes, I was there three years. I had I did have a few tear ups, but I'm not going to come on here and say oh, I weighed this geezer in, I picked this up, and I smashed this guy, and fuck off. Like, fuck all that. I'm not about that. Um, if it's if I have to, I will. Yeah. But it's not my go-to. And I, to be honest, I like to have a laugh. I've got a good sense of humour. And for me, I didn't really get any of that. People were just coming up going, oh, Essex, Essex. I was fucking tanned to shit, yeah. I was big then. I come in all juiced up. And um, a dirty Joey Essex comb over going on in a, in a green and yellow bodysuit. Most people were looking like, what the fuck has this cunt done? Because most people wearing it obviously probably just killed someone. So, or done something serious to be wearing it. Obviously, you're one week in the banana suit. Mm. Did you get sent to Belmarsh or not? No. Oh, you didn't I went. Know. I eventually went there. I eventually went there because they, they put my court at um, Woolies Crown Court and Woolies Crown Court goes is local to Belmarsh. Um, but they didn't. They kept me in Highdown for 10 months and then my trial started. And being in Highdown, the reason why I touch on prison so much is because most of the people I have on here sit here and go, yeah, prison weren't hard, you know, I liked it, this, that, this, that. But you're not one of them guys. No. You're, you've done what you've done. Yeah. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and say you're a fucking nerd. You've done what you've done, yeah. yeah. But you're not a you're not a guy that wants to live in prison for the rest of your life. You're not about that life. You're- I'm not. I'm not. A, I won't say the word road man, but I'm not at all. I was educated, and the things I've done, I've done out of choice, mate. Yeah. I firmly thought about what I was going to do. I wasn't in a bad place, and my mental health was bad, and I was poor, and I had to. I've done it because I fucking wanted to, mate. And I can I can outright say that, yeah. And. I want to touch on prison after. Talk us through what actually happened. Why you went prison? I got pulled into a conspiracy where they said I was allegedly attempting to import firearms from America into the UK. How they got onto that was they arrested my co-defendant because they caught his fingerprint on a load of... Sorry, i am fucking got the lurgy, mate. They, um, they found his fingerprint on, on the one fake note, the fake 50, yeah. A fake 50, yeah. One fake 50. They caught these group of lads with a pile of fake 50s. My, my co-defendant's fingerprint was on one. They've nicked him. Plugged his phone in. Yeah. Got loads of conversation between me and him. What phone did he have? An iPhone. So they can get into yeah. iPhones? They can get into iPhones. I think, I think he gave them the code, right? Thinking there's nothing on here. Because what they do is they threaten you with something called, I think it's called the Rip the Ripper Act or something. They've done it to bollocks. Me. When I got they? arrested, they were like, if you don't give the code, you're going to get an extra year. I was like, mate, I'm leaving tomorrow morning, you can't. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's just a scare tactic. But when you don't know, you think, well, there's nothing on here. Yeah. Fuck it. Well, there fucking was something on there. And there's conversations with me. So they've come and got me. They nicked me. They arrested me for counterfeit money first. They've released me under investigation when they took all my devices and plugged all of my devices in. They've got back, right, and I didn't give them the fucking code. They've got into my phone, and where my WhatsApps, stupidly, just arrogantly, mate, didn't delete them. Well, I didn't, they were backed up. So they got back, I think it was something like half a million messages was the evidence against me, yeah. Obviously not all of it was was related to the crime, but the the evidence file was half a million messages. it It was massive. And a lot of it was all voice notes. So, and they've got me... Me talking about all sorts, mate. Seriously. Did they actually get you red-handed with any cash? No. Nah. The, uh, the money, money I was banged to rights because it was like, yeah, I've got that, mate. Yeah. So it was in the messages, it was confirming that it actually happened. And we were sending it out to sending it out to America. And my mate was changing it up over in Mexico because it's not like Euro exchanges out there. It's like Pedro's Corner Shop yeah, that has yeah, a fucking yeah. currency exchange at the back. So they were sending kids in there with like three or four quid, changing it up and then Western Union it back. We're bang to rights on that, mate. Threw me hands up straight away. But there was messages concerning firearms coming over, which there was nothing that confirmed anything happened. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. It, the messages didn't look good, and I had a lot to answer for. So that's why they, that's why they went in as hard as they did. Yeah. And you got not guilty for that? I got not guilty. Yeah, I had a month long trial. And I tell you, I tell you what, mate. Listening to your voice notes back in a courtroom of fifty people, mate. Everyone's like this at you. And the thing is, they pick out the voice note that makes you sound the worst. Yeah, they do. If it's the whole conversation in voice notes, sometimes like, yeah, right, yeah, I was having a 
conversation about X, Y, and Z, but they pick out. It could be a one minute long voice note. They're going to give give you three seconds of it. The thing with the thing with a trial is it's actually quite hard to convict someone unless they're bang to rights because. When the judge gives his directions, when he says to the jury, you've got to go off and make your decision now on this man's guilt or innocence, he says you have to be beyond any doubt of this man's guilt. And if you've created any form of doubt that it might not have happened, you might not have intended to do it, because it's not about whether you've done it now, it's about whether even if you intended to do it. So you cannot commit a crime, but they can prove that you intended to commit it, you get the same as if you've done it. You get the same? You get the same. Wow. And that's a fact. Because they knew... So if it, me and you sat here and planned to rob a bank... I could, I could say to you, right, I'm going to bring a kilo of gear to you later. Yeah? I could say that to you if you went, yeah, mate, sweet. That there is a conspiracy, right? And, and even if I didn't do it, if, say, you've got previous for it, yeah. you're guilty. We're getting done for a kilo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just any police that's officer not happening, that. yeah. is, That's not yeah, involved. Just, <laughs> that was just an example. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing them, they're gonna they're gonna nick us both. Play, play that nick one us, clip. They're gonna nick in us prison. both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's you know what? So I've had a solicitor on here, and he was telling me his job is obviously to prove people make it, people innocent and get away yeah. with it. And he goes, look, at the end of the day, my job is to convince one person in that jury. Yeah, he ain't done it. He goes, that's it. He goes, all I need to convince is that he may not have done it. Yeah. He goes, it's a lot easier to prove that he may not have done it than to prove he done it. 100%. Which, when you think of it like that, it is true. And if the jury like you as well, th there's 12 people in a jury. What happens is they all need to, to find someone guilty or not guilty. It needs to be a unanimous decision. It's got, what is it? It's got to be... Ele no, 10 of them have got to... For the first day or two, the judge will keep it. All 12 have to decide. If it's dragging out the decision, he'll give a majority of 11 to 1 or 10 to 2. Mine got... up uh, Four days I was fucking waiting for my decision, mate. Serious? And I got a majority not guilty. I got. I think I got a ten to two majority. Not guilty. So when they found these firearms, these the conversation with the firearms. Yeah. How bad was it? Yeah, it was bad. I was telling someone how to take them apart, where to put them, where to send them. That bad. Yeah. And so, but the, in my eyes, is that not intention? That's what they were trying to say. There was intent. Yeah. So how did you obviously? What was your defence? My defence, which which was the truth, was um, I used to get on it a lot. I used to party a lot, mate. And the times of the morning would be speaking, would be early in the morning. And I used to party and I'd just chat shit whenever I got on the gear. Mm -hmm. And all the videos on my Instagram would show that I was partying, all the videos. They were putting up videos off my phone of me at after parties with boys, girls, coke, fucking everyone naked, things like that. And showing exactly my lifestyle back then. Absolutely. That's and your point. I turned around and said, look, I might have had those conversations. I can't deny saying what I said, but... I had no intention of ever doing it. I said, we, I had eight month period to do it. And, and they've already accepted that it didn't happen. So they're trying to put me away for fucking double figures, double figures on a fact they think I might have done it. Am I a cunt? Like, like come on. Like, yes, I get it. it's a serious thing to do and a serious thing to talk about, but a serious thing to plan. But double figures for a conversation. And you've not that done they, it. That they know that they accepted that they didn't, it didn't take place. Oh, the so court the court world. accepted that? The prosecution accepted that we do, he said, we do not believe this took place, but we think Mr. Gray's intentions were serious and he would have done it. Wow. Imagine, when you deep it like that, imagine yeah. sitting behind doors. What were you looking at? How many years? I think minimum they would have given me 15, but I would have had to do two thirds of that because it was, because it's firearm. So I would have had to do, I would have had to serve 10 years. Yeah, and I've imagine done actually, guys, if you lot are watching this, yeah. imagine sitting there and deep in this. Yeah, fair enough, he had the conversation, but imagine being in prison for just planning something. Because I know, listen, there's many viewers out here who have planned to do all sorts with their boys. Yeah, yeah, let's go do that guy. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. You're going to prison for that nowadays. I knew I, was, I met a guy in jail in, when I was in Belmarsh just on that topic. He'd messaged his mate saying, I want to kill this guy. He hadn't paid him to do it. He said, have you got that You got that thing still? The guy went, no, no, I'll go pick it up tomorrow, the gun. Right? And he said the geezer's name. The guy never went to pick the gun up. So that's intention. He obviously didn't want to do it. They both just got 18 years, conspiracy to murder. Didn't even do it. Wow. Because it was on the Encro chat, the encrypted phones. And, they, and what the, the, in the courtroom, they said having an Encro phone was intent, a criminal phone. They're saying, so you, you were going to do it. 18 years. They got served the full 18 each. 
two geezers, wow. mate. Wow. Just talked about doing it. Yeah, that's, that is a bit... Mad, isn't it? They don't say this. They put in the papers, two lads convicted of conspiracy Attempt, yeah. to murder. They don't put the ins and outs of it. The fact they openly decided not to go ahead with it, but because they talked about it on a, on a phone line or on a, on a network that was set up for criminals, they were going to do it. And previously, they've both been done for drugs, I think. 18 years. Each, yeah, wow. a piece. And regarding the money, how much money would you say was flowing through your hands? Fake money. They said they said there was two million in them notes, yeah. I don't think it was that much. Um, Allegedly. Ele that's what, that's, what, that's, what, they, that's yeah. what I got done for, yeah. And they started me at five, and with mitigation, took me down to a three. I serve half of it. So obviously, there's more to your story. You've done three behind, well, you've done 15 months behind the door. I've done three years in total, yeah. But to start? Oh, to start with, yeah, I've done 18 months. 18 months, sorry. Yeah, and then just as I was about to go, because once I got not guilty for the guns, I thought, brilliant, I'm going home soon. Yeah, I thought it's got to be sentenced on the money. I've pretty much done my time on that. They'll give me about a three and I would have done it. And when I finished my trial, I got, went back to my cell. A few days later, I get a charge sheet through the door, charging me with blackmail dating back to 2018. They've been holding on to the charge for a year and a half while I've been in prison. Well, they've done that on purpose? Yeah, they, the prosecutor told my barrister um, that it was an insurance policy for the trial. They weren't even going to run with it, mate. If I got found guilty, they wouldn't have even bothered. And there was a victim involved in that charge, yeah? That says to me they don't give a fuck about the victims. They care about you. It's personal. Yeah. All they cared about was getting you, right? So they, so they weren't even caring about the victims. The victims could have got compensation. They could have got justice. They weren't bothered. They used that charge as an insurance policy to make sure I didn't get out of jail. Yeah, and it worked. So what actually happened with this blackmail situation? I understand we can't talk on it too much. Um, family involved and we leveraged information to get money. Can we say how much you took? 100. Okay. Fair enough. And that's that's what we got done for, yeah. Sitting in a prison cell thinking, sweet, I'm going home. I'm going home soon. Yeah. Pack my bags, getting ready. I'm on my way home soon, mum. And then you get you wake up next morning, you got a letter through the door saying another year another how long did you do extra? Eighteen months. Another eighteen months inside. Yeah. So he started me at five years again on that blackmail, mate. He started me and then took me down mitigation to three. So he took he took off a load of time. Because one, it should have been dealt with with the other stuff. Because they could have run, they could have run concurrently together, yeah, yeah. both offences. So we took off a lot of time for that. The judge did, um, but still landed me another three years. So in total, they started me at ten years for everything. The money five, this five, and took off a load of mitigation. And you do off, and a couple of dodgy notes. Look, I'm not taking away from what I done. Yeah, I was, I was, I was active at the time, and they could see that in my phone. It wasn't just, it wasn't just all this. My phone was busy. And they could see all that. So they were thinking, we need, to, we need to bump this up as much as possible to get this guy the biggest sentence because he's been at it. And, he's got, and they're saying he's got away with a lot. He's, he's, so look, I understand. And I'm not glorifying anything or, or trying to say, well, I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have done it. I should have fucking been there, mate. I, I needed a slap and to be taken down a peg at that time because I was going out all the time, partying, throwing money around, giving it the big one. And it, it was needed. And I can put my hands up and say that I, I'm, I'm glad it happened. You glad you were in prison? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why? It gave me a reset, mate. It's reset my whole brain, my whole way of thinking. I'm the same guy that I was before. Exactly the same. <laughs> the same character. But my, the way I look at the world is very, is very different now. And it's reset my brain from, from the lifestyle I was in. All the partying, all the... So you'd, you'd find a move to do to earn a load of money. You'd make it. you think, yeah, sweet. I'm going to fucking go to Dubai now for a month. I'm going to buy this, buy that, buy this watch, do this. And then you think, right, where's the next move? Do another move and do it. It's got me out of that, mate. It got me out of that. It's the same vicious cycle, basically. And it's the same with anything, like relationships as well. Like before prison, I couldn't have held down a relationship at all. I was two in my own little world. I was, I was, I was doing gear from every Friday till Saturday night. So 24 hours a week, I was probably sniffing coke. Uh, and then I was in the gym for the rest of the time and planning my next six-figure payday. No, mate. That's a very, very toxic, destructive mindset to be in because that money, I've said this before, is cursed. Any money you earn that quickly from those sort of means is going to be spent on one thing, mate. Girls, drugs. It all goes quick. It goes quick. Anything that's a immediate pleasure 
you're going to spend that on. Nothing, nothing for longevity. I say all. easy come, easy go. Exactly. Yeah. And doing what you've done in prison, you went Belmarsh, probably one of the most dangerous prisons in the UK. Yeah, that's fair to say. Yeah. That's what it's known for. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of serious guys in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was it like? Genuinely, what was it like in there? Because you're an Essex boy. You are through and through Essex boy. Yeah, mate. Going in there and you've got some serious gangsters in there. You have, but they're just like you and me, mate. Yeah, you know, I've said it as well. From meeting all the guys who I've seen in prison, I've had people come in here who've been in prison for 27 years. Mm. When you sit down with them, they're sweet people. Don't get it twisted. You get some you get some serious guys. Yeah. Some people are a little bit off key. Yeah. But they're, they're, when you meet them, they're just, Jane, listen, I've done it. I don't regret it. I move on with my life. You get a different calibre of people in these places, yeah. You get the people who are doing things for money. They've got a business. Their business is crime. They're making lots of money. They look after their family. They have nice things. And obviously, when something goes wrong in their business, they need to get violent to sort it out. They can't bring a fucking lawyer and send them a legal letter for a bill. You know, it don't work like that. Um, but you also get the fucking wrong ones, mate. The people that are in there for hurting innocent and vulnerable people. You get people who are in there for serious violence, who are just very violent people. Not Maybe not violent against vulnerable people, just against men. Yeah. Um, you get the fraudsters. The big the big money guys are a little bit awkward, a bit... A bit bit quirky but they're making loads of money fucking robbing banks online and so yeah and you get the petty criminals the one that are robbing their nan for money so they can buy crack you know like and there's so there's a different caliber of, of person in there so you've got all these different personalities in one house yeah your wing there's about 120 people in your little area someone might have killed five people someone might have made 100 million quid fucking smuggling a couple of tons of coke a year you know and you've got someone that's just robbed his nan. So everyone's walking around the yard together, all completely different. But what I've found is the people that have done the worst things are the nicest people. Do you reckon? 100%. Not necessarily murdered five people, but the people who are doing the most serious crime are the nicest people. And they've got morals, they've got values, they're smart, they're not stupid, and they don't want trouble. They're making loads of money. Why do they want to come to prison and have trouble? Know, they true. come to prison. They're, they're probably their business might still be running, and they're coming there for an easy time. They don't want. They don't want to be kicking off in the showers. They don't want violence. The only ones that are violent are normally the younger ones, all gang related. So all the postcode wars in there. I'm big. I'm white, and I, I don't really care. Like no, I don't. <laughs> it's sweet. No one really had a problem. I just had a laugh with most people, mate. Did you have problems in prison though? I had a few, a few more. It's, it's more when you've got loads of people living under the same roof, when personalities clash, and they've clashed for a few weeks. And someone's just pissing you off for a couple of weeks, yeah. He's doing the same thing every day, and you're looking at his face, just hating his face, because you've got to fucking see it every day. And one day you get up, and you might have had a bad call from your lawyer, or, or you've had a, just a row with someone on the phone, or it's not a good day for you. And you look at him that day, you think, yeah, to, you're getting it today, mate. And it's, that's more what it is. It's more just politics and people just getting under each other's skin, or if you owe someone something. Or some of the worst things you saw in Belmarsh. <laughs> I, I don't know how much I could say this because, oh, fuck it, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a, I'm not going to mention the name of the guy, but there was a case where there was a foster a couple. They fostered a baby and the baby died. Yeah, and the, both of them got, got big sentences. I think they got 20 years. There was a family in London, I think it was. Now, he should have gone on the vulnerable wing, yeah, with the nonces and the fucking ex-police officers and... The fucking weirdos, yeah. He should have gone on there. But he was a big lad. So just to confirm, sorry, obviously making it clear. They yeah. killed the baby? They killed a put they fostered a child and they, they abused not be, not sec but they weren't they weren't I think they parents. dropped him and they, they, they got a long time for it, yeah. Wow. And it was known. But the officers aren't allowed to tell us. But the officers don't want these people on the wing. They don't want to see them. They're human beings in a long yeah. way. So some of the officers that are a bit of the, like the bit laddish would be like would would tell the boys, mate. As if to say, please just get this cunt off the wing. And he'd been jumping from wing to wing to wing because he refused to take the book. When you've done something which makes you a vulnerable prisoner, you, they ask you to take the book, which you go on the VP wing. And, you, and VP wing in Belmarsh, mate, is, is the monster's wing, mate. Like, you've got boys in there that rape their daughters and disgusting human yeah, beings, them. mate. This, it, it's savage. And the whole wing's blacked out. So the big boards, you can't see them. When they get moved to their jobs around the jail, they get no one's allowed to travel where they travel. They get escorted. They're protected. And they're all put together, these weirdos, yeah? So when you do something like that, 
they ask, they tell you, listen, we advise you go on there because when these got when these boys see your face come up on BBC News tonight, it's a problem. It, it's on, and we're going to have to lock you in your cell all day. And and he goes, no, no, I'm not going on there. Refused. So he wanted to. He thought it was a big. Jump and he jumped from wing to wing because people kept rushing his cell. Right, and he kept beating him up. He was a he was a lump. Oh, <laughs> boys were running in his cell, and he was smashing them. Oh, for real, he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they were moving into another wing, to another wing. So and he they, was the one doing them all in. Yeah, and they they put him on they put him on our wing, <laughs> and everyone by this point knew this knew this geezer was, but he was walking around the wing with a big smile on his face, like 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 he thinks he's a man, like G checking people, and and like, gr- like grinning, smoking his vape, walking up, going, "Has anyone got any vape caps and things like this?" And there were these there were these little white lads here. I think they're from from Essex actually and they both just got 20 years for murder little little lads right they get life they've got no money outside they wanted a few quid and some of the boys said right we'll pay you to go do this cunt yeah yeah they've got nothing to lose innit nothing to lose man they wanted a bit of money in the bank that's a dangerous person so what they've done and well <laughs> they've gone in his cell and he was praying yeah they've poured you know that the hooch yeah you know it's in the hooch the alcohol in jail no. We know the, the alcohol you brew and okay, you make yeah, yourself yeah, in jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These fuckers can distill it. You use the emblem of a kettle and you can distill it so it's clear. It looks like vodka. There's proper chemistry going on in there, mate. I ain't got yeah. a clue. They threw a load of distilled vodka over him and set the cunt alight. This video is sponsored by Cranbrook Law, an award-winning immigration law firm. Their talented solicitors can help when any struggles arise regarding immigration law they can help get you the visas they need they can help get you the staff you need from any other countries as you can see the website is on the screen right now so if you need anything to do with immigration law message cranbrook law and let them help you whether you're looking to obtain a sponsor license receive advice and guidance in relation to compliance and our civil penalties or take advantage of our know-how and experience across a broad range of business visas our talented and dynamic immigration lawyers are available to speak to you telephone numbers on the screen emails on the screen and hit the link in the bio if you need any help right he's running around the wing on fire yeah the officers went hold a minute boys they waited about 30 seconds before hitting the bell and they've hosed him down right wow. yeah and um all the uh, all the all the muslim guys it was it was it was friday prayer so they were all coming back from friday prayer and the whole wing smelled of bacon of pork so they were going who the fuck is cooking bacon yeah and one of the officers laughed, went, oh, no one, we've just set one on fire, though. Bacon bonds, nonce. A bacon is a nonce, yeah. isn't it? So, and everyone's laughing, like, as if it's funny. And was he, was he proper hurt? Like- he, he was fucked. Yeah, he was fine, but he, would, he, he I think he lived down the hospital wing for the next year. But <laughs> I don't know about a year, but oh, he, right. he, was, so he, he was, was fucked. He was done. He, he, needs, he would have needed skin grafts and everything. And it was, all, it was all, that in there is seen as funny. So you're put in an environment where something of the most extreme violence yeah. can be seen as humour. Right? Yeah. And then they're releasing you into society where you can't even fucking say anything without offending anyone now. And you're completely desensitised to violence, to that sort of dark humour, in a way. Not humour, but dark world. Yeah. And you're put in a very overly sensitive community now where you have to be so careful what you say to people. And you're just not ready for it, mate. You're not equipped for it. That's, that's, but it's a mad world. Yeah. In the sense as it's setting someone setting someone alight, lighting them up, and the people who are meant to be protecting you, the guards, are saying, yeah, yeah, let him burn, let him burn. The guards, let's get one thing straight. You get officers, yeah, who are by the book, mate. You know what I mean? Preppy, yeah, yeah. preppy in school, got probably got bullied. Yeah, and they want a bit of authority. They think oh, I'm a prison officer. They I mean, I tell these criminals yeah, what yeah, to do. Yeah. They go home to their fucking miserable wife every night and say what hero they are and that they told everyone what to do and they're the boss on the wing and everything. But you also get ones who, who, who are quite funny and they're just a bit laddish, you know? Yeah. And they they like the lads on the wing who are a bit funny, a bit boisterous, and, and they get involved in some of the humour, some of them. So that's the two different calibre of, of officers. So... Violence in jail is encouraged. For real? Yeah. It, like, out here, words, words don't have any consequences. I could call someone whatever I wanted, and if they hit me, they're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? In there, if two people start mouthing off at each other, and they go in the cell and, and knock, knock the fuck out of each other, and the officers know, 
as long as no one's no, no one wants to report it if one of them goes i want to report him for hitting me they go really okay and they then they take a statement it's it's all it's, as long as they don't report it nothing's getting done yeah Pr prison is, is is not what it seems is it as corrupt as everyone talks about yeah belmarsh no I, I mean i just told the story about the fire in there but that was more corruption in terms of people bringing things in yeah yeah in and officers people, yeah, that are at it belmarsh not as much because it's a category a jail and it's very strict i mean officers go through body scanners to go into work every day in there like it's it's very hard it's very strict um when the bell goes off in there you have literally 30 massive geezers turn up within less than a minute and that's when there's an emergency right? yeah like whenever the bell goes the wing is flooded within within less than a minute of offices and what yeah. would happen for the bell to go someone not going in behind their door when they're meant to will well, press the bell off you, get, you you go behind your door at bang up they if, if you say and they go i'm not fucking moving they go you fucking are and then if they have to physically touch someone, the bell's going off. Two people fighting, the bell goes off. Yeah. And you was in both Cat A and Cat B prison, yeah? yeah? And C for a little bit at the end, for the last three months. What really is the difference between A and B? A is the added, the, the difference of crime. Uh, I mean, as in rules-wise, as in, is there um, any actual difference or is it the same Yeah, shit? we get, we used to get scanned to leave our spur for metal. Just leaving your little area, you get scanned. To go on the yard, you get scanned and, and, and searched down just to go on the yard. That's that's more strict. And yeah. you can't... It, free flow, because free flow is where they open the gates and let you walk freely around the prison to whatever your activity is. Yeah. Free flow is heavily monitored. Because in there, they take into account people that have conflict. So if you're from one postcode, he's from another, they know you've got conflict, you can't move at the same time. They're, they're on it in there. They try and separate violence. So if you're from... Hackney, they'll put you on the wing with everyone from Hackney. Yeah, because they they, what they want to they want to contain the violence in there. Yeah. So, pr pr and for you, you're not you're not a postcode gangster. No. You was a business criminal. You was in the crime of, in the in crime to make money. Uh, yeah, I would. I only did things for money. Yeah. Other people yeah. are there just because they need to prove a point. I'm from this area. You're from that area. I'm gonna do you. I'm gonna do. There's this. a lot of egos in there, mate. Yeah, of course. A lot of bravado, a lot of egos. I've never, I've never, because they gave me a job in Belmarsh, um, induction orderly, yeah? So I had to sign in all the new prisoners that came in. Oh, God. <laughs> so I saw every face that came through there for about a six, six to eight month period, yeah? And you see people coming back from court in the evening without their murder trials. And these boys would come back, 18 years old, all high fiving each other, going, yeah, we're here, fam, we're here, fam. It's got 18 years, mate, 20 years, all high fiving because they're about to go off to some fucking shithole up north to the dispersal prison where they're going to live for the next 15 years of their life and i just think it's not going to set in yet mate in about three years it's going to set in you're done when did prison hit you it didn't for a lot of my sentence because i was on remand for a lot of it so i didn't know what i was going to get and i'm always i'm a very optimistic person so i thought no it's sweet i win this trial i'll get out I win this, I'll get out. Something will come up. I'll get it'll get dropped. I'll get out. So I, I always had my gave myself that bit of hope the whole time that things would that I'd get through it. And I thought I've always got through everything in my life. So this 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 is gonna be another just another hurdle for me. So I kept that kept that hope and I kept training. I kept myself busy, reading, and it didn't really prison never really set in for me in terms of because I wasn't there was always that always had that court case looming yeah. where something could happen. So right three months time I got another court case. This could happen. And so for me, I just set myself on my next court date, my next court date. So I never thought, was right. like you're going out time, innit? That in my head, scary. I thought, and then something would happen. I didn't. I thought, fuck, right, another three months, another court case. Until I got sentenced for the blackmail was the longest period I didn't have something upcoming where I thought, right, I've got to do another 18 months. That's when prison kicked in for me because it's like, right, I have to be here now for another 18 months. Now I need to think about getting to an open jail so I can go home on weekends and things like that, which I never fucking got to. Um, was you ever sharing a cell with someone? Yeah. And what was that like? Yes, it's sweet. No issues. Some, nah. Sometimes, sometimes it was when they put when you first get there and they they put you in with like people withdrawing on heroin. And I was get on the fucking bell. Said, listen, no. And then then they move move you with someone else. But I was very lucky with my cellmates. I was in with this old boy. This is old old school guy for ten months in in high down, and we're still mates. He's an older guy. He's, he he's fucking for? cool at drugs. I think he was an old football hooligan, back with the old ICF days. I think, yeah. Um, so he was a good. He was good. He was good stuff. Another one was I became good mates with. You once told a story 
I listened to it. It was Tippy was this main reason I wasn't doing stuff. You know when I saw that I was like, oh. Go on. About the guy who just come on trend. Oh yeah. Tell us that story. How did you find that story out? He told me. He was in Belmarsh on the yard. Little geezer, he just got 33 years for shooting his mum's boyfriend's head off with a shotgun. Yeah? And he, so he was telling me all this gear he was on. He was little and fat. And I thought, what are you fucking doing? <laughs> he was coming up to him about steroids, can I get any in here? And things like that. I thought, I thought, mate, if there was any steroids on the wing, believe me, I'd be fucking taking them. Yeah, I kept my, cer- my cell got searched all the time for steroids. All the time. And I was like, I said, Gov... If there was any gear on this wing, I would be taking it. Like I, was, I said that openly. There is none. I want some. Um, Can you bring something for me? <laughs> yeah. Well, fucking, yeah. No. Um, but he he said he blamed the trend for it. It sent him loopy. He said it sent him loopy. His mum had an argument with her boyfriend. I can't remember the ins and outs of the politics of what happened, but he, he, he blew his head off with a shotgun. That's him. 33 years, mate. And do you know what this guy did? He was living in a fantasy world, mate. I don't, I don't want to laugh. But he, was, he, renounced, he just renounced his British citizenship, yeah? Thinking that because he's no longer a British citizen, he might be able to get deported to another country and get released. I looked at him and thought, he's like, yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got this one under wraps, mate. I've got this top lawyer that's helping me in doing that. I thought, do you not think that other people might have, might have tried that, mate? Where was he from? South London, I think. What, so he's English? He's English, lad. It was... What country was he going to get deported to? I don't fucking know. He denounced, <laughs> so I mean, he denounced his British citizenship and he was trying to see if he could get citizenship in another country. It, it, prison, you start thinking mad thoughts, mate. You start going a bit loopy. Obviously, this guy's a Brit as well. He's a little white English lad, yeah? And he said, I'm no longer British. He's no longer British. And he wants to get deported to another country. He's been apparently writing to embassies, his family have, to try and get him citizenship. So these other, these other countries, growing, growing nations, are going to take a lad who's just blown someone's head off, yeah, <laughs> got 30 years, and say, do you know what, mate? Come fucking live here. Yeah, you know? come, man. Yeah. We want you here. Take some... You know what? Yeah, you'll you be great for our here, economy, mate. Yeah. When yeah. you land, we'll give you some trend as well. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you, you can maybe shoot a couple of people we don't like here. Yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but... To touch on steroids, you've listened, openly said you've done steroids. Yeah. I'm guessing when you went into prison, you was on juice? Yeah. And you couldn't get any inside. What was no. the... Well, COVID hit. Lovely. I got lockdown hit three weeks after I got to jail. So I got to jail, right? And it was all open regime. I got a job quite quickly. Um, it was, if, you got, if you worked in the kitchens, right, in high down, um, you get to go gym every morning. Right, between between eight and quarter to nine. Every morning, Monday to Friday. I thought, sweet. Sweet, I'm good. That'll do me for the next year. Um, <laughs> literally, I got three or four gym sessions. And this officer came to our door and went, uh, we've got to do a complete lockdown because of this coronavirus thing. Right? We didn't leave our cell for two weeks. Didn't leave. I didn't well, get a shower for two all. weeks. Not at all, mate. Wait, so you didn't shower? No. Nah, we are washing in the sink. Fuck I was off. with this old boy as well. We found it funny. Bless him. We, by the end of it, we were just laughing at how ridiculous the whole situation was. The officers were dressed up like fucking Ghostbusters, yeah? Bringing us our dinner every night to the door. All seriously, we had to stand at the back of the fucking cell while they put our food in there. It was, it was mental. I've never seen anything like it, mate. What? I've gone from living in a nice house in Essex, doing whatever I want, having to stand at the back of a room where a Ghostbuster feeds me my food every night because I can't go near him. It's just, it's just the biggest, biggest life flip ever but your hormones and stuff like that from steroids how were they affected by going in somewhere yeah. being on juice to being on nothing well i've been on juice at that point because i cruise i don't take a lot and i've always said this like a lot of people take a shitload they blow up like a balloon and then they come off and they deflate as quickly as they blew up yeah, and i prefer to take a smaller amount over a longer period so i've been on trt i suppose for about four or five years mate Oh wow! Where I was doing a lot of photo shoots and and, and fitness things, I, I just I needed to be in shape all the time. And for me, coming off wasn't an option because training was part of my life. I'd train every day without fail, and I needed to look a certain way all the time, regardless of my lifestyle. So for me, I, I'd take as minimal as I could to be able to sustain my lifestyle and keep and keep those results while I was partying all the time and training all the time. So I do one shot of test a week. And I'd do a little bit of Anabar here and there and, and HGH. That was all, and I, I did jump on Trent a few times, but I'm surprised I didn't catch a fucking another charge on that did shit. Did Trent mate. affect you? 
oh, it just makes you whatever you are, you become more of, mate. If you are a cunt, you become a massive cunt. You know, like I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry but you do. If you're if you're an aggressive person, you become very aggressive. Yeah. If you're a very sexual person, you become like a fucking dog. Like it's 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 one of them ones. It enhances all the all the animalistic. Well, look, he went and you. blew off his mum's his partner's head off. Yeah. So clearly, exactly. Trend's not the full the full thing. No. But I think, look, to touch on your story, I want to talk a little bit more about your money. Because I've had people come on here with guns. I've had people come on here with blackmail. But the fake money situation, mm. whose idea was it? Because it sounds like it's a good idea. I got a phone call years ago saying, Toby, my mate's got a load of these notes. Should we do anything with them? And what were the quality like? They were shit. Oh, really? You couldn't con a 12-year-old, mate. Oh, they were I'm shit. Not, they were shit. Like, and that's the thing. I saw them. There was fucking pallets of them, yeah? And I saw them, and I went, these are fucking dog shit. But I had a mate that lives out in America, and he, he used to put on events over in, like, like Tijuana, like parties over yeah, in Mexico, yeah. right? And he said, send me some. So I, so I put, like, five or six notes in an envelope, and I sent them out to him. He looked at him, he went, yeah, we can do them. And they're terrible, yeah? Yeah. So he was taking, but you've got to remember, they ain't got scanners in some of these yeah, little yeah. shops. So he was taking them into these little shops, getting kids running them in there, just changing them up. And sending them back. That, that's it. And we were just doing it every week, every week, every week without fail. And we yeah, just kept running through them. Piece of piss. How much oh. were you sending every week? Uh, 10 grand. Ten Between 10 and 20. Which didn't want to do it on a massive scale and overdo yeah. it. But he, I, he kept 30%. And we took the rest. That's sweet. Easy money. We don't recommend it to anyone. So guys, don't, no, no, don't no, get no, any yeah. ideas. It's not, yeah. But that was the game he was in. And... When you're dealing with that kind of thing, obviously, you must have had people coming up to you every week with a new idea. Every week. There'd be a new idea to make everyone millionaires or get everyone big jail sentences, mate. It's just new. <laughs> and, big it, jail sentences. and honestly, you sit there at the time like, oh yeah, this sounds fucking great. Um, but looking back now, what, what I got done for and what I've got away with, mate, I'm, I'm very grateful. And I'm grateful now to be sat here and not sat in a fucking cell. Um, so just, you're out on the other side now? You made it out. You've done your three years behind the door. What was, when you was coming out like? Did you lose friends? I got put in a hostel when I first got out on, on a tag. And they monitored me into the community. Um, <laughs> got put in a random town. I put in Reading. Reading? Reading. Fucking shit, some fucking shit street in Reading. Um, for four months. Why did they put you there? Is that where you had they to, like to They like to monitor you when you come out. So couldn't you go back home? No, nah, they wouldn't let me. They won't. They wouldn't let me to my family home because there's guns in the house and I've got a firearm ban. Even though I didn't get done for it, um, my family do like hunting and things like that, and they got shotgun licenses. So I'm not. I'm not, I'm not allowed there. So they put me in a hostel, approved accommodation, um, which was all right. Do you know what? I could walk to the gym every day. I'd be in by seven. I got my life back. I got my phone. I was. I was all right. Um, it was a massive upgrade. But, and then I moved, I went and got me own place, yeah. And what was the hardest thing about coming out? The people. Really? Yeah. I can't stand anyone, mate. <laughs> but why? Everyone's just horrible now, aren't they? I've, I've not been spoken to as badly in three years in the most violent prison in England than I was in, I'm in fucking Sainsbury's by some horrible little bird of her husband, mate. I got out and I went to Sainsbury's to buy loads of food, yeah. I'm walking around thinking this is amazing, steaks and everything. Yeah. I'm thinking, that's out there, the big smile on my face, walking around <laughs> my trolley, right? And I'm there just looking at everything in awe. And this woman just bumped my trolley and she's gone, move. I thought, you <laughs> fucking what? Like, and her husband's gone, you heard her. I've sat there looking. I was in shock. I've not been spoken to like that in three years, mate, so, by what's classed as the worst so people in the world. So what did you say back? Nothing. Nothing. I've just looked. And I went, got my trolley and just walked off. I didn't say nothing back, mate. I thought, I've got to go. Especially you're still on license. You can't turn I thought, I'm not going to have a go at some woman in it and her house. But like, I thought, I've got to go. And that's the hardest thing about coming out, is, is the difference in people you're hanging around with. In prison, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not supporting people and what they've done in there. But you're around th free-thinking men. People in there, they don't, they don't care about the law. Yeah. They don't care about what people think. They're not governed by anyone. They do what they want to do. They look after their family. They look after themselves. 
and they do what they and they do what they want to do in life, right? And they and the police arrest you and they put you in a fucking house full of free thinking individuals, right? And they release you and expect you to go get a job in fucking Costa or DHL. You have they they have affiliated with DHL in jail. So all these boys that are earning fucking fifty hundred grand a month, yeah, they go. You can jump on our scheme for when you're released and make fifteen hundred quid a month working for DHL. Are they going to do that? Oh, seriously, be they're serious. not going to do that, mate. No chance. They're going to go. All right then, sweet. <laughs> and they're going to come out and do whatever the fuck they want. And that's and that's that's the problem, mate. Because the system itself, it works for what the authorities want, but it doesn't work in the conventional sense of what we think it's for. We think it's for rehabilitation plus punishment. Yeah, but it's. Sorry, but it's not. It's it doesn't rehabilitate you at all. It makes you a lot worse. Listen, what I always say as well, it's a it's a room full of gangsters who are bigger gangsters who all know how to make money, all know how to do crime, and you're all put together. You're just going to yeah. become better at what you know. This is the system and how they want it, Mike. Yeah. So you take an eighteen year old lad. He gets caught with an ounce of coke. Yeah. yeah? They nick him. They give him eighteen months for for possession with intent to supply class A. Yeah. They throw him in a big boy jail. He's 18, yeah? Around people who are selling 50 kilos, 100 kilos, right? He's hanging around with them all year, listening to them, having a laugh with them, joking with them. He then gets released. What's he going to do? He's got all his new little mates in his phone, right? Is he going to go get a job? No. He's going to use those contacts because he's not been taught anything else. And next time they nick him, in three years' time, he's going to have 20 kilos on him. And that is that is the cycle. So on that note, yeah, listen to this. I got a phone call from prison about a month ago. Someone I knew was in prison. He got my number from someone and phoned me up. Talking about a situation, something completely irrelevant to what he's inside for. Talking to him, talking to him, talking to him. And he turns around to me and goes, Oh, bro, when I get out, I'm good, you know. What do you mean good? I met all these boys in here from here, here, here. When I get out, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, fucking hell, you've mm-hmm. gone there to be stop what you're doing yeah and now you met people who you're coming out to get straight back to work yeah stuff that's 10 times worse i've got i've got mates who the day they walked out the jail were back at it mate and jail's not a deterrent when you've been there you've realized i ain't gonna kill you it's not that bad like listen it's shit and boring and you can't fuck anyone and it's it's you can't i've heard some mates. stories you know i've got to be honest yeah that. i've heard the, some stories in some of the big long-term jails some of these guys get to know the female officers for a long period of time and things get a bit naughty. We actually have one. I went to this sea cat jail called The Mount for the last three months in uh, Hemel Hempstead. Yeah, yeah. And the corruption in there. Where it's a sea cat, it's low security. So there's not much security going on. The boys can basically run around doing what they want, yeah? There was a senior officer woman, right, in there, yeah? I won't say her name. Yeah, careful what you say. <laughs> Fuck her, she got nicked. Oh, she didn't um, get nicked? Yeah, she, yeah she got nicked. There was videos going around on everyone's phones in there, right, of her sucking off all the mandem. I swear, on, I swear down, mate. She was sucking off all the boys in there. They were sending it round, and I wasn't her type. I, I've got the wrong colour, mate. Um, <laughs> but she, she was going around doing things with them, letting them film it. Yeah, she was bringing them all in spice and other things. And the spice that she was bringing in, a few people died on in the jail. I think there was four deaths in the period I was there in three months because it contained fentanyl. And so the, the national search team did a swoop of the whole prison. We had dogs in there. We had to literally lift up our bollocks and squat down. They would look up our asses and everything. They, they did a whole swoop of the jail, the jail looking, for, looking for this spice. And it was her that was bringing it in. And I remember the day she got marched out with her handbag, crying her eyes out. And that was a senior officer on the wing. Do you know how long she got? No idea. But I think she, she would have got remanded. She would have ended up in Bronzefield or something with a female jail. That's mad, though, isn't it? Mad, yeah. mate. That... Fuck. So that's one corruption thing I heard. Or I weren't involved in it, obviously. But um, that was happening in the prison on the wing I was on. No, prison, prison's bad. But, like, it's... I think prison's what you make of it as well. Yeah, 100%. Because a lot of people crumble. It's not for the faint-hearted. If, you, if you've got bad anxiety or you can't switch off, it can be really difficult, mate, and it can be very lonely. It depends on your personal life outside as well. If you've got missus, kids, I didn't. I was a single man when I went in. I rung my old man a few times a week. I rung the boys. I got a visit once every six months. I weren't bothered. 
Yeah, I didn't care, mate. Your life's not going to stop because of it. I, well, it's your hard. life stops, but as in personal life, I wasn't... Yeah, you ain't got a missus. You ain't got someone who's waiting for you on the outside. I'm you not sat got... there hoping my missus and my Don't kids turn up to see me or your missus. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. No. So I wasn't worried about outside. I just concentrated on what I was doing in there. All right, and uh, let, let's wrap this up. Bit of advice for the younger generation. What would you give them? Keep doing what you did. <laughs> nah. Um, if you are involved in anything, when you do get nicked, make sure you get nicked for something small. Because, and get a little taste of prison. Because I think the problem with the younger generation now, in this whole mental health fucking era we're in, is, is no one's really suffered. And it takes a period of suffering to realise how good you've got it. And the society we live in is, is, is to live in this Western society we have is, is a privilege, mate. And we have a lot, and we have a lot of opportunity. And I think if you are at it, make sure you get nicked for the small thing, not the big thing. hundred uh, percent. I think, I think yeah. what I will say as well is, it's coming from someone who's done it. That wasn't your life, you're yeah. fair enough. You've done what you've done, but it's not the only thing you can do in life. No, it's like, not. There are many ways to make money. And the world, world we live in now, it's actually very easy to make money if you just put a little bit of, a bit of hard work in. And, but, you know, we both said off camera just before it started, the UK is making it so hard for people to be legit. Yeah. They're the price of everything. Yeah. We sat down, we spoke about other countries and how expensive it is over there and how expensive it is. The UK is just, it's just extortionate. It's making it very difficult because you, they obviously charge you a lot in taxes. They tax you on your taxes. They tax you for everything. They put fees for everything. I mean, in London, you've got to pay 30 quid just to enter London now in a car. Like, it's it's... They're making it very hard for people and, and to not do anything wrong. Yeah. Then you do something wrong, then you're fined for that. And it's just, it is hard now for the younger generation, unless they've got, got the attributes and the qualities to be able to go into the financial services maybe and make a couple of million quid working as a trader or a stockbroker. A lot of them are turning to naughty behaviour. Do you know the one thing I always live by, and I've said this a few times on Insta as well, if we're not meant to commit crime... Explain to me why cars can go over 70 miles an hour in this country. But genuinely. <laughs> they give you the gun, mate. They just tell you not to fire it. it it's That's mental. Just, like, it's just another it's thing. Everything with choice. Like, they, they, the society hands you the gun. You've just, you've just, just whether you fire it or not, mate. <sighs> it's fucked. But listen, I've got to say, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, mate. Long time Appreciate coming. It. Guys, get ready for this episode. I'll see you on the next one.